you may be familiar with J.R.R. Tolkien's wider world of work. Certainly his most famous works are The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and if you have serious nerd credentials, maybe The Silmarillion. But of course, Tolkien was a professor of ancient languages and mythologies, and he wrote extensively on all manner of topics. And there was a moment where he ventured into an area of literature with which he had only an amateur's familiarity, even if this area was one that he loved dearly. It was, of course, the realm of fairy stories. Fairy stories like the princess who becomes betrothed to the frog who brings back the golden ball that she dropped in the pond. Fairy stories about the third youngest brother named Simpleton, who, despite the enterprising wiles of his older brothers, finds himself helping a goose endangered in the middle of a lake, helping ants whose colony has been kicked over, helping a honeybee find its way back to a hive, and in so doing finds friends for himself in the order of nature and becomes king of the land. You may be familiar with the world of fairy stories through popular Netflix shows that mine Grimm's fairy tales and the stories of Hans Christian Andersen for foundational content on which to build new intellectual property. But unfortunately, the actual occasion in which fairy stories are told and shared happens very seldom in our lives. When was the last time you found yourself in the woods, at night, around a campfire with friends or family? When was the last time you found yourself on a long, still hike through forest, uphill, over dale, into the few remaining expanses of unharmonized nature? When was the last time you found yourself peering over the bow of a boat at sea in the night? as all manner of leviathan moved in the deeps beneath you and seem also to move over the starry expanses overhead. To speak of fairy stories, says Tolkien, is not to speak of the world of drama in which human egos clash and bang to often tragic effect. To speak of fairy stories is not even to speak of wonderful and fantastic theatrical production, full of astounding special effects and wonders and sleights of hand. While all of these things, drama, theater, magicianship, might touch on the outer reaches of what makes fairy stories so distinctive, they don't ever really touch on the heart. What makes fairy stories so powerful and potent and singular, speculates Tolkien, is the realm of fairy itself, F-A-E-R-E. Fairy is the world of twilight in the forest, as shadows cast in unfamiliar directions obscure the path it suggests the presence of more than just you and your companions. Fairy is the feeling as the fire flickers out and one is left solely with the coals burning in the dark of curious, possibly malevolent, but certainly other presences in the wider world of sense and sensibility. Fairy is that strange draw behind the curtain, that sense that just around the corner of the castle one might catch some glimpse of some unexpected thing. Fairy, in other words, is the world of enchantment. It's the 
kind of story we tell to get at that strange, uncanny feeling that there is perhaps something more. Maybe in that vast field of rocks that comprise the Icelandic coast, there really are strange and nimble creatures. Maybe in the depths of the caves, under the highest reaches of mountainous Austria, there really are long-fingered reptilian beings catching fish and larger prey when possible. This sense of uncanniness, the gothic and macabre side of which, of course, is the ghost story, that can give us a bit of the heebie-jeebies, that can give us a sense that we aren't fully in control and that we do not fully understand the world in which we find ourselves. This is the power of enchantment, says Tolkien. It is fundamentally the work of the imagination. And yet, fairy stories have endured the rise and fall of all manner of other kinds of storytelling and media because they speak to something deeply true about human experience. We get degrees from prestigious institutions. We take online courses to pad our resumes with credentials. We build profiles of ourselves on the internet and compete with other profiles in the cryptocurrency of likes, loves, and retweets. And yet, somehow, some way, we have the conviction deep in our spirits, in the wakeful stillness of night, that perhaps there is more to life than this constant marketing of self, of content, of personality. Maybe there's more to life than doing what we can as often as we can to hustle a few more dollars into our control. Word is spreading around the region of Galilee about this strange miracle worker. And some people, perhaps for desperate need of healing, perhaps out of a vague sense of curiosity on a Saturday afternoon, perhaps out of pure boredom, gather together when this man walks into their region. In fact, there are so many of them that come out of the woodwork to catch a glimpse of this strange figure and maybe to hear his voice. But when he arrives, he doesn't stand in their midst. In fact, he gets into a boat and ferries out a little into the sea. And from there, he speaks to them. Listen, a sower went out to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, the path that is trodden over time and time again, the path in which the soils are so compacted that it would take more than a sprout and fresh germination to push that compacted earth apart. And some seeds fall on rocky soil, where the enthusiasms of newness, of what is different, of what is novel, lead that seed to grow up fast. But when the sun rises, as the sun always does, and when the full scorching heat of noonday arrives as surely as it always does, does it even need to be said? what happens to the sprouts in the rocky soil. Still other seed falls among the thorns. The thorns that have turned the wonderful growth of life into an architecture of defense that proliferate spines that prick and draw blood. And there is no way that seed growing up around such defensive botany can possibly grow and thrive. 
And then, of course, some seed falls in the good soil, and it produces grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Parables and fairy stories are sister forms. Both seek to speak to something deep in our hearts and far outside of our hearts. Both draw us into a world in which we see ourselves and yet do not see ourselves. And both, in some mysterious way, fill us with a sense of new possibility. Are we, in this story, the enterprising, capable, older siblings who put down the younger sibling, even as that sibling is helping the powerless animals that he comes across? Are we the princess beguiled by the frog Or are we the frog beguiling the innocent for personal gain? Are our hearts made of hard, compacted soils of the path? Are there rocks in the soils of our hearts that stop the good seed from taking root? Are there thorns in our gardens that are choking out the life and the growth and the grain that God would make possible for us. Where might we go? Who might we be? What might, against all odds, become possible for us or the soils in our hearts to be good Soils. Christ does not give us pure, clear instruction. He does not run down a spreadsheet characterizing the kingdom of heaven. He gives no subscription plan. He offers no fully realized program, no series of sermons. No playlist of YouTube videos. No season of podcasts. He tells a story in public that evaporates as soon as he's told it. And yet that somehow, some way lived on in the imagination of his followers, such that when it came time to communicate to the next generation just who this person was, they could not help but tell the stories that he told. Parables confuse us. Make no mistake. You will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. Uvalde, Texas proves that. Their ears are hard of hearing. They have shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. And I would heal them. If fairy stories call us out of the familiar into the realm of fairy, of the uncanny, of enchantment, Parables just as surely call us out of the realm of the familiar into the expansive space where the spirit of the living God is powerful and active and quickening all the while our hearts into a new way of living in this world. Faith does not begin in the mind. 
the truth of God is not a concept or a program or even a practice. It is rather an invitation that calls our hearts and that gives us the power, even now, with which to respond. Christ does not appeal to their reason, nor does he appeal to their sense of moral obligation. He does what so few of us have left any space in our lives to do. He appeals to their imagination. The kingdom of God is like someone who went out to sow seeds. What would happen if those seeds took root? How might the world itself seem just a little different to us if this parable was true? In a moment, we're going to gather around the table of the Lord to receive by faith the very body and blood of Christ. And soon after, this small feast that we share together will become part of our bodies, part of our hearts. We will go forth from the sanctuary to make future plans for the church, to make future plans for the week, to catch up on a few things before Monday morning. But we will also go forth asking ourselves anew the seed planted fresh in our mind. What if? What if there's more in the forest than silence? What if there's more over that hill than just more of the same? What if there's more to the life of faith than mere belief, than mere ideology, than mere tribal loyalty? What if the world is, in fact, far larger than we realized? in the invitation of God on our lives, far nearer than we had expected.